Okay, well, I guess. Don't say anything mean now. <laughs> Sergey is the best PI ever. <laughs> just kidding. I love you, Sergey. If you're listening, if you're here, <laughs> is he here online? Can you click on the participants? Not here. He's not even here. <laughs> wow. not funny. Well, I guess I'll shut the doors. There's a good amount of folks online. So. Hey, hey, good morning. Good morning. Yes. Oh, well, good, good afternoon, guys. <laughs> yep, yep. I guess I'll shut the doors. Okay, can uh, the people online hear me? Can we get a thumbs up from someone? Okay, someone says yes. Cool. Nice. Cool, cool, cool. Okay, guys, so um, today I am presenting this paper. It's called um, Community Aware Transformer for Autism Prediction in FMRI Connectome. Um, and so it's written by these, uh, this team from the University of British Columbia. And I think the paper is pretty recent. I think it either came out this year or maybe last year. <clears throat> so this is just a brief overview of what they're trying to do in this paper, kind of like what they contribute. So um, they added this uh, uh, transformer architecture called, they're calling it Combrain TF. And it's a variant of a hierarchical transformer that um, is doing this, uh, it's learning these node embeddings for, uh, in, in order to try to predict th these, um, this connectome for functional activity. And so uh, essentially it's this hierarchical local global transformer that learns intra and inter-community aware node embeddings for the ASD prediction task. So I know that's like a mouthful and I want to try to hopefully get into it and explain it a little bit. Just some clear on the task, sorry to interrupt so early, but you said yeah. oh, they're doing classification, right? Because you, you said they're predicting the connectome. So are they using the connectome to predict? Yeah, the class? That's, okay. yes. Yes. Okay. So yes. So uh, this kind of brings us into this topic of connectomics. And it's a discipline where um, people are, I guess, trying to understand how different parts of the brain are connected. So there has been this age old question of what part of the brain is responsible for what function. And um, I guess people started asking this question because uh, maybe they wanted to try to determine if someone has a disorder, what part of the brain exactly is malfunctioning and causing that disorder. Um, but it turns out that this was kind of an oversimplification of how to think about higher cognitive functions like attention, emotion, and language processing. And we learned um, that every brain area is a part of a larger brain network um, that is responsible for different cognitive functions. So now uh, we're asking these types of questions, which are what networks are responsible for different functions in the brain? Um, and where are the different parts of these networks located in the brain, and how exactly uh, are they connected? So I think this is the kinds of questions that Connectomics is trying to answer. Um, so the major motivation for this paper um, is doing this ASD classification task. So um, ASD stands for Autism Spectrum Disorder, and autism spectrum disorder is a lifelong condition that affects social and uh, social communication and behavior. Um, so it's pretty much really worth uh, looking into how um, different functional regions are connected for individuals uh, with ASD uh, because it can help in understanding and diagnosing ASD and hopefully lead to um, more effective treatments. And specifically, people, uh, individuals with ASD, exhibit abnormalities in the default mode network, 
and how this network is connected to other brain networks. Um, and so studies have found people, uh, individuals with ASD exhibit these hyper and hypo connectivity with other functional networks. So that's why people uh, can look into this functional connectome and try to reason about how to perform these kinds of classification tasks for ASD um, individuals. Of course, using other kinds of um, neuroimaging data, you can uh, do classification tasks based on uh, age group, biological sex, and um, other uh, look for other biomarkers as well. But I think this paper is just mainly focused on the ASD classification versus healthy control. So uh, a term that's used in this paper is um, ROI community. And an ROI is just a region in the brain and a, um, it's a region of interest in the brain. So like we might look at a small group of um, voxels in the brain and want to understand what functions, um, what, what cognitive functions do, do these voxels participate in. And an ROI community is just a group of different regions of interest that are participating in the same uh, functional network. So- um, Not necessary, right? Uh, can you say that again? Uh, not necessary, uh, because uh, sometimes regions of interest are uh, based on some predefined at loss or some parcellation, right? So it may not be, um, associated with the same function, but especially at the same. Yeah, I uh, I think when they say ROI community, they mean, um, so I think there's eight different brain networks, uh, essentially like eight main brain networks. And um, of course you can, you can like get more than that, um, but- um, Yes, I understand that brain networks may be functionally connected, but not necessarily region of interest. That means the same region of interest may not be fully functionally connected. Yeah, so you can parcelate the brain into different networks, and each network contains uh, it's kind of like a cluster of ROIs that mm -hmm. participate in that. So, like a set of ROIs can belong to a functional network. Essentially, that's how that's what I'm getting from it. Um, so, yeah, mm -hmm. so that's what I think this this is the ROI community, and yeah. We'll commonly do it based on canonical atlases, right? Of connectivity, like the very standard regions, mm -hmm. not like even based on functional resting networks or anything weird right. like, like that. Mm -hmm. so it's, yeah, I think um, that's pretty uncontroversial. Yeah, so I think uh, this is just like uh, the the deeper part parcellations, and uh, then inside of each one of these uh, networks, it's just uh, different R lines. So uh, each each network has uh, ROIs, and ROIs can be a member of a network, essentially. Um, so, and then people are studying this functional connectome. It's also called the fMRI connectome. And um, essentially what this is, is um, functional brain activity that we measure from fMRI. It's represented on the graph of the structure. So where the nodes, are ROIs, so each node in this graph is an ROI, and the edges are, express some kind of a relationship and connect the ROIs. So I think we can measure the similarity between uh, different ROIs using some kind of a di distance measure. And I think we use the uh, Pearson correlation coefficient to make these um, connectivity matrices. So that's one way to think about it. But yes, so people are trying to estimate this full uh, functional connectome, which is an expression of how exactly these regions of interest are connected to each other. And also that's an expression of how the different uh, kind of macro um, networks in the brain are connected as well. So um, in this paper, they started talking about some different research that's been done in deep learning for, um, kind of uh, analyzing these connectomes. Um, and these are some of the baselines that they're going to compare their method to um, in their experiments. So uh, one of these is the convolutional neural network baseline that they're looking at. Um, this is called BrainNet CNN. 
So this is this particular paper. Um, they are using this deep network that's designed for predicting brain development outcomes in preterm infants. So it does this using uh, structural brain connectivity networks. And this particular network works with um, DTI data. And um, so they use this structural connectivity information to learn topological features and predict age at the time of the scan and brain development scores. So this is kind of similar uh, to what kind of uh, task that this paper is trying to do. So I think this architecture could be adjusted to perform the ASD. Uh, yeah, the, hey, Joanne, I just, uh, I, I haven't, do, do we know if anybody's using DTI data trends? This is Will. Using DTI data? Yeah. Ellen use it, uh, we use it for Catacil. Uh, I don't know if there are people that use deep learning with DTI. Uh, Eloy and I have talked about it, but uh, but yeah, there are a lot of people that use it. It's just mostly not uh, our deep learning people. Okay. Um, the paper that I'm going to present is very kind of similar to the paper she's talking about on the slide, I think. But um, the uh, they use DTI data to create like a structural uh, graph of the brain and try to link that to the temporal information you get from fMRI to kind of uh, link dynamics between um, of uh, map uh, structure and function. That's like a big question. But I don't know anything, know much about DTI data yet, so I'm kind of looking into it. Yeah, from what I can tell, um, people use DTI data with uh, different, different kinds of, uh, different modalities of data to do this thing called tractography which is this 3D modeling technique that's used to visually represent nerve tracts. Yeah. So they can like see- Specifically them. looking at connected white matter through the brain. Yeah. Uh, and it uses, so DTI is looking at the diffusion of water in the brain uh, specifically. And so you can do some, uh, some clever tricks with gradients and stuff to figure out where tracts are kind of flowing. Uh, uh, tractography is uh, arguably not uh, possible to do per subject though. Uh, or actually it's not, it, you, you get a lot of blurry, there's like a lot of issues of tractography and, uh, and stuff and, and individual subjects effects and stuff. But yeah, it's commonly used for looking at these structural, like actually like finding where the white matter is, like where the uh, the end of the nerve is going in the brain, nerve cell. Yeah, cool. But yeah, so um, this is the baseline. I think that they're going to adapt to their experiment in terms of uh, CNNs. Um, and so, yeah, William, you mentioned, uh, I think your paper is actually gonna be what is on the next slide, uh, which is this uh, brain GNN. I think you're gonna present this paper, um, but yeah, this is another baseline that they're exploring to compare to their method. And this is uh, their graph neural network example. So this is a, an architecture called brain GNN. It came out in 2021. Uh, and it's designed for analyzing fMRI data to discover uh, neurological biomarkers. And they use this information to do a prediction task, but then they also have this interpretability at the end where they perform this clustering uh, and they, they try to find these communities of um, brain regions that were uh, salient to predicting the uh, label. Um, and also too, they find the bar biomarkers as well. So it uses these ROI aware graph convolutional layers and ROI top K pooling layers. And again, it just is selecting these salient brain regions that are informative to the predicted test. So um, this is another example that they're using as a baseline to compare to their results. And I think this is like the state of the art for the uh, um, graph neural networks uh, in terms of doing um, uh, prediction tasks on fMRI data. And they also are looking at the transformer baseline specifically uh, for this prediction task using fMRI data. And um, so this one is called Brain Network Transformer. Uh, it's also called BNP for short. And um, so we know transformers came on the scene in 2017. And so they've been utilized also for this brain connectome analysis. Um, the, uh, specifically here, the functional connectome. 
And um, I think they, they've shown to be great for this task because they can learn long range interaction between ROIs uh, without having a predefined graph structure. And this example, uh, I think outperformed the two previous examples. And it shows that the transformer-based methods outperform CNN and GNN models for fMRI-based classification. So uh, basically what this does is it's modeling connections between ROIs as graphs with fixed size nodes. And uh, this model uses something called connection profiles as node features. And then it learns these pairwise connection strings among ROIs. Um, then they do this clustering uh, operation and um, they, they kind of uh, create this graph structure at the end that they then flatten and then try to perform the prediction based on that flattened graph structure. So that's kind of similar to what this method is going to do, except the main difference between this brain network transformer and this uh, transformer in this paper is that uh, this brain network transformer is, is considering each one of these ROIs as separate uh, tokens, whereas um, the transformer in this paper is trying to leverage some information about uh, the different regions or communities that these um, ROIs could belong to. So that brings me to my next slide. Like, uh, we know that the human brain connectome is actually a hierarchical structure. Um, because uh, we know that ROIs that are in the same community, or we can think about that belong to the same functional network, they're more similar than ROIs that are across different communities. Um, so we can, you know, possibly leverage this information to perform, uh, to create a better estimate of the functional connectome and see if that would improve our um, prediction task, our uh, classification accuracy. And um, so, yeah, since we know that, uh, since we know that the human brain uh, connectome is hierarchical, and we also know that ASD individuals uh, exhibit hypo and hyperconnectivity across these different networks. So it should make sense that we should leverage this information. Uh, however, the existing deep learning models that we discuss don't use this, uh, don't use this information. They're not really including any kind of community labeling uh, as input to the models. So um, that's what this paper is gonna try to explore. Uh, again, this is just some of the limitations in the previous uh, research. So the brain network transformer outperforms these um, CNN and GNN models for fMRI-based classification um, by estimating this functional connectome, but these existing uh, deep learning models don't leverage this community hierarchy um, because they are treating all of these regions of interest um, individually. So that's what this paper is going to try to do. So they're using two transformers together. They have a local transformer that is taking these functional connectivity matrices as input, and it shares the parameters across all of the different communities, and it learns these personalized prompt tokens. And we're gonna get more into what that means. Um, and Next, they have also this global transformer that's trying to learn the global brain network, whereas local transformer is trying to understand networks in the different communities. The global transformer is fusing this whole brain information, and it receives the class tokens and the node embeddings from the local transformer. And so then it uses the pulley layer to summarize the final predictions. And um, so this is kind of the problem def definition uh, explained in the paper. So the first step is that we parcelate the brain into these uh, N ROIs based on a given atlas. And then from there, we can construct the functional connectivity matrix using the Pearson correlation. And so for a brain that has N nodes, we can, uh, we can call the functional connectivity matrix X. And this is a symmetric matrix, it's a square matrix, um, and it's just an n by n matrix. So uh, this we can also extract a feature vector at, by just taking the j row or any column from this matrix x. 
So we're going to go from the fMRI, uh, then we're going to get this fMRI uh, regions of interest, mean time series, and construct this Pearson correlation matrix, where each row or column is a feature vector representing a certain ROI. So uh, next, this is what they do in the paper to try to leverage this community information. So they take the um, functional connectivity matrix and they rearrange it based on the community membership. So essentially what this does is they're just sorting this matrix based on uh, community membership. So like the first K rows or like we can say N sub K rows uh, is representing the ROIs in community one or just functional connectivity, uh, functional network one. Uh, and, you know, we can take the next rows that belong to community two and so on. So once they do this uh, kind of sorting operation, uh, then you can extract um, groups of rows or columns and use these as like separate input matrices. So let's say there's K uh, number of functional communities, uh, then we'll have K of these like sub matrices of the full uh, um, F and C. And lowercase K, we'll just call that the community number. So each one of these input matrices is um, having this N sub K tokens, where N sub K is how many um, ROIs belong to that community. And each one of these tokens is an n-dimensional feature vector. So we can think about these sub-matrices as like a sequence. Um, and the sequence is containing n sub k tokens. And each token is having dimension n. So we can take uh, each one of these sub-matrices and, and provide it as input to our community transformer. So for community K, uh, we'll have a transformer that's trying to learn uh, this token, this output token, we'll just call it H. Um, and so the transformer for each one of these matrices, X sub K, will output an n-dimensional token, uh, H sub I, where I goes from one to the number of, um, number of ROIs in that community. So for a community matrix H, uh, X sub K, the output token is this, um, is this matrix H sub K. Um, so that's what these uh, local transformers are trying to do. And um, next, we'll take this, all of these tokens that are output from the local transformers, and um, we will concatenate them together and provide it to the global uh, transformer encoder. So this global transformer learns an embedding that maps this, uh, all of these different uh, tokens, H, to some kind of a like latent um, matrix Z. And it's a, also a square matrix, this n by, n by n matrix. And we'll explain how that works in the next slides. After that is a pooling layer and these MLPs that are used to um, predict the output versus um, ASD versus um, healthy control. So this is the transformer encoder. Um, for this work, they're just using the transformer encoder and they're doing this for both the local and global transformers. And so for this, uh, for this uh, encoder, the input is an, a functional connectivity matrix, whether it being a local um, functional matrix or a global one. And then um, they have this multi-head attention module which is capturing these in, uh, interdependencies between nodes. And uh, the output of the transformer encoder is this learned node feature matrix H sub i, which we discussed. So this is how, kind of how the local transformer is working. And the purpose of this local transformer is to learn community brain networks. Um, so it's kind of focusing on how are the different ROIs within one community connected specifically. And um, how they're achieving this is they're using this prompt token 
which is provided for each one of these uh, input matrices, X sub K. And just remember, X sub K is like a small subset of the original functional connectivity matrix, uh, such that uh, any member of this X sub K matrix is an ROI in a specific functional network or community. So we're using these prompt tokens and for each different community, we're having a prompt token. It's just a column vector um, that is the same dimension as the ROI. And um, so these are just unique and learnable vectors that are used to distinguish between the node feature matrices of each community. So they're doing this because it would be really, it would uh, cause over parameterization to have a different um, transformer for each one of these communities. Because like there could be eight communities or depending on the resolution of the brain networks that you want to have, it could be more. So they're just sharing all of the different model weights. But uh, in order to distinguish between the different communities, they're using this um, column vector prompt token. So that way um, they're avoiding this over parameterization and they're using the same local transformer for each community, essentially. So uh, the local transformer is just taking this prompt token as input and they're taking the community's functional uh, connectivity matrix and the transform encoder for the local community outputs this P prime token as well and then this, um, this uh, H token. So they do this for each one of the communities and then uh, they're going to provide this uh, result to their global transformer. So the global transformer is trying to learn this global brain network and uh, how they're doing that is they're trying to combine the the output of the local transformer uh, with, so they're trying to combine the output of the local transformer. And that output is these community specific node embeddings that are learned, which is the H uh, matrices. And they're also trying to um, leverage this information from the prompt tokens as well. So, the input to this global transformer is this P global token, which is just the concatenation of all of the different prompt tokens that were learned at the local level. And then they just uh, pass this to an MLP, which maps it back down to the one by N um, column vector. And then uh, the other piece of input is this H global. Um, matrix, which is the concatenation of all of the different learned node embeddings at the local level. Okay, so I think let's see if we had any messages in the chat. We're good. Okay, does anybody have any questions so far? <laughs> really good question. Okay. So um, what is the output of this global uh, transformer? So this global transformer is also running multi-head attention. On, these, uh, on this prompt input token and on this massive learned node uh, feature matrices, H global. And so the output is this attention enhanced node in, uh, embedding matrix, ZL. And so this information is uh, essentially like this um, combination of uh, global connections across communities of the different ROIs. Uh, also, at the same time, it is this uh, like attention, uh, it's this attention learned um, node embeddings for each one of the separate communities. So uh, next, once this, um, once this global transformer finds this ZL um, uh, matrix, uh, it, the next step is this graph readout layer. And um, so, uh, let's see. So, sorry, one sec. Um, yeah, so basically the purpose of this graph readout layer is to try to like take in this massive ZL matrix, which is containing all the macro and micro connections of the, in the functional brain. And they want to just produce this high level representation of the brain graph. So they want to uh, try to turn this into some kind of a, a graph data structure. 
So they use this OC read layer, which um, initializes these orthonormal cluster centers and then softly assigns nodes to those centers. So what that does is it learns a graph embedding, uh, ZG, and ZG is just uh, this uh, combination of this matrix multiplication here. And uh, with this matrix A, and A is this um, assignment matrix that's learned by this OC read um, computation that happens in this OC read graph readout layer. So once we find this ZG, it's flattened and then it's passed to the MLP for the graph level predictions. Um, so this is just kind of getting into some of their experiments. Um, so they worked with the Abide data set, which is a resting state functional MRI data set. And um, the data is captured across 17 different international sites. And it's parcelated by the Craddock uh, 200 Atlas. And the ROIs are belonging to either of the eight functional communities. And uh, so for this data set, there is about a thousand subjects and about 50% of them exhibit ASD. Uh, so uh, about 50% of them have um, the autism spectrum disorder diagnosis. And this, this is just the experimental settings that they used. Um, so their models were implemented in PyTorch and they trained on the uh, NVIDIA V100 and so I, I won't like read all of this, but uh, the number of attention heads that they used was equal to the number of communities. They did this for the, both the local and the global transformers. So this is the results. Um, you can see there's like uh, an improvement across the board for uh, this model, which is community brain transformer. Um, however, it seems like maybe they have a little bit lower specificity uh, for some reason. I'm not exactly sure why. Um, but yeah, so it does seem to be outperforming the other models that were mentioned. Um, so, based on the standard deviation, so. Oh, no. Okay. Yeah, I guess it's kind of marginal improvement. But it's kind of interesting to see how they interpret the results. Um, so they looked at the average um, attention scores at the global um, at the global transformer for all of the predict, uh, correct uh, predictions. So they wanted to see uh, the attention uh, in the different brain networks to see if it's kind of like highlighting this um, networks that are kind of prominent and influential for ASD prediction. So it turns out that yes, the uh, attention scores are higher in these AS, uh, ASD prominent networks like the um, SMN region, which is a green arrow, and then this uh, the default mode network, the VAN, and the FPN networks. So uh, what this means is that the higher attention scores mean that uh, connectivity between these networks is important for this uh, ASD prediction task. Um, and then uh, they did this, uh, they did another kind of visualization here where they were investigating the first row of this learned attention matrix, uh, namely the attention scores of the ROIs that were uh, corresponding to the prompts, um, this prompts token vector. So um, the ROI wise normalized attention scores are shown here in this uh, image. And how they were generated is using this average prompt vectors over the uh, correctly classified data. So um, the red and blue is the different attention score values where blue is the lowest and red is the highest. And uh, so you can kind of see, they're kind of just visualizing these different uh, attention scores across the brain networks for healthy control uh, individuals and ASD individuals. Um, and you can see a difference in these um, prominent regions uh, versus, uh, between the healthy control and the ASD individuals. So yeah, um, that's, that's pretty much it. So what they did here was they're proposing this uh, novel uh, hierarchical transformer, community brain transformer, 
and they're learning this local global um, directions of ROIs. So they're using this ROI level information as well as this community level information. And um, they kind of cleverly did this by sharing the weights across the local transformers, but utilizing these prompt tokens uh, that are unique across communities. Uh, so that way they get to share the local parameters. And so then they kind of just did these um, experiments and uh, visualizations that were just kind of showing and proving the efficacy of their work. And so they were able to show that they did get marginal improvements over the other um, uh, over the other uh, architectures, and but their visualizations are showing um, these functional connect uh, functional connectivity and attention scores are higher in these brain networks that are specific to ASD and healthy control of classification. And yes, so that's my slides. Does anybody have any questions? It's pretty straightforward method, right? I mean, sense to use a higher for transformer for this kind of data. Uh, yeah, okay. Any questions online, guys? All right. Well, I guess we can stop. I guess it, how hard do you think this would be to implement? Have you tried it? No, um, I don't think it would be too hard. They have their they shared their code online. Uh, I'll try it on some static and see data. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, I don't really know anything about this uh, like graph readout stuff, but I, I don't think it should be too hard. Yeah, I, I feel like it was explained pretty well in the paper, like pretty straightforward. Yeah, okay. Well, I guess we can stop the recording now. And um, if anybody doesn't have any questions, we can just conclude. Do you have any ideas about how you would innovate on this? Do you see anything like that you think is done correctly or not correctly, but just that you could improve on even that? And so this, we've looked at hierarchical transformers. We were looking at the, at the dilated VITs for segmentation. So I wonder if like there's some kind of trick that you can do as well where you don't need like I don't know the same level of local information or you can somehow like, combine things in a, in a way that would make inference faster. I don't it's not a huge deal for functional connectivity though. It's so small. The data is so small. Yeah. Um I'm not sure. I think uh, we were looking into doing something like this for the mass screen project. Uh, but we were going to try using this other kind of uh, parcellation called uh, dictionary or functional modes. Um, so I think we could try to extend it to something like that. Uh, just, I think leveraging this biological um, information and, and labels is what I think gives uh, models like this an advantage over just straight up using the ROIs separately. Um, so yeah. Yeah, and totally and incorporating other modalities like DTIs, the natural multimodal thing to do. I think William was going to talk about that or with this stuff. So that's cool. Yeah. Oh, yeah, makes sense. Okay. Hey, uh, oh, thank you. Okay, thank you guys. Yeah, thank you. Sure. Yeah.